I grew up in a non-Christian home and I'd say that my faith journey began when I was in junior school. A school friend, Barbara, invited me to go to Sunday school with her and I went along, started going regularly to services, etc. And over time I ambled along on my Christian journey, my faith journey I suppose you'd call it, and I thought I was doing okay but I didn't realise that I was a sinner and in need of a saviour. Well, the years rolled by when I was, we were in our late teens and things started to change. Uh, both my friend Barbara and my sister reached a turning point in their faith journey and made a profession of faith and started a walk with Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. I believe that the Lord had been knocking on my heart's door for some time, but I didn't feel ready to make a commitment. Uh, I didn't feel that I knew enough, didn't believe enough, and wasn't good enough. So I talked things through with our church minister, and he helped me to realise that to become a Christian had nothing to do with my own merits or achievements, but the price had been paid by the Lord Jesus in full when he died on the cross to take the blame and punishment for all my sin and wrongdoing. I took a step of faith, I prayed, confessing my sin and asking Jesus to make his dwelling in my heart and to become my Lord and Saviour. I handed my life over to him and I had such a peace, all those barriers of doubt and unworthiness were swept aside and, well, a chorus we used to sing with the children captures this so well. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That means you, that means me. None of us are perfect, you've got to agree. But Jesus, who is perfect, died for you and me. Well, we want to welcome you to Kasalam Evangelical Church this morning. It is a real joy to have you with us. And we've heard already this morning, Chris his story of how she understood that she needed a saviour. The Bible story is so clear, so simple, and the Lord of heaven and earth wants us to understand his character. One of the Old Testament books says this in Micah chapter 7, it says, Who is a God like you? Pardoning sin, passing over transgressions for the people who are your inheritance. You do not continue to be angry forever because you delight in showing steadfast love. This is the character of the God of heaven and earth and he longs to show mercy to all. Let's just pray as we start the service this morning. Father, thank you that we can run into your presence today because we know your character. As a child runs into their, their home, running to their parents because of their love that they have for their children. Lord, we run to you now and we ask that every heart would understand that there is peace and life in Jesus. We pray every heart listening today would understand this love and run to you for that mercy that you long and love to give. Bless every heart now, we pray for your glory. Amen. We're going to sing to start the service this morning. Who is there like you? Who is there like you? And who else would give their life for me? Even suffering in my place. And who could repent? 
continue our look through the parables of Jesus. We remember those stories that Jesus wants to tell profound truths about us and him and the world. And today we're going to be looking at the parable of the tenants. It's in Luke chapter 20 and starts at verse 9. And let me read this for you. He, Jesus, began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that it would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him, sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but they also beat it and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. He looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them, but they feared the people. We'll be looking at that in a a little bit more detail in a few moments, but we're going to watch a video now explaining why Jesus uses parables to explain profound truths. Jesus of Nazareth was a master teacher, and some of his most well-known teachings are told in short stories called parables. Yeah, like the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was looking for pearls, and when he found the ultimate pearl, he sold everything so that he could buy it. Must have been some pretty amazing pearl. Or the kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed that a farmer planted in his garden. It grew and became a huge tree, and birds came to perch in its branches. And that's a beautiful image, but what does it mean? Exactly. Jesus didn't tell parables to make everything clear. Rather, he wanted to provoke the imagination and invite people to see what God is doing in the world from a new perspective. So let's talk about how to read the parables of Jesus. Now there's many great teachers that throughout history have used stories to teach students about morality, religion, philosophy. But Jesus didn't use his parables to teach abstract religious or moral ideals. He said that his parables were about himself and his mission. His mission, which was to announce that the kingdom of God was arriving on earth as it is in heaven. Right. So in Jesus' day, the Israelites were ruled by the Roman Empire. 
But their scriptures promised that one day their God would come to rule his people as king. And so many Israelites wanted to revolt against Rome and fight for their freedom. And this is what some people thought of as the kingdom of God. Exactly. But Jesus was a poor traveling prophet, healing the sick, inviting people to follow him. And he said that this was the arrival of God's kingdom. And that didn't fit people's expectations. Right. And so Jesus used some parables to help people imagine that his small movement was the arrival of God's kingdom. Oh yeah, like the parable that the kingdom of God is yeast hidden in a lump of dough. And you might not see its influence, but it's going to change everything. Jesus also told parables about the upside down values of God's kingdom, about how the least important people in the world are actually the most important people to God, especially those who are poor and of low status. Yeah, like the parable about the business owner who hired workers throughout the day, in the morning, later in the day, and even towards the end of the day. And when it was time to pay everyone, he paid them all the same wage. Right, Jesus is showing how money and status are irrelevant to God, who offers his generous mercy to everybody. Now, not all of the parables have happy endings. Some are really intense. Yes, Jesus stood in the tradition of Israel's prophets, who also told parables to criticize Israel's leaders because they mistook their kingdom for God's. So Jesus warned the leaders of his day, if they don't accept his offer of God's kingdom, they're headed for destruction. Yeah, like the parable of the landowner who built a wonderful vineyard and he expects it to produce fruit. Yes, Jesus gets this parable from the prophet Isaiah, but then he adapts it. Right, and so the landowner appoints managers to take care of this vineyard. And at harvest, he sends servants to collect the fruit but those managers kill the servants. And so the landowner sends his own son to confront the managers and they kill him too. And so Jesus asked the people around him, what do you all think this landowner should do? Oh, he's gonna punish those managers and hire new ones. Jesus knew that if Israel kept on their current path, they would be destroyed by Rome. And so in parables like this, he's forcing people to make a decision about his offer of God's kingdom. Are people going to reject him, ignore him, or trust and follow him? Now, if this message of God's kingdom is so important, why cloak it in parables? Why not be more clear? Well, through riddles and parables, Jesus could make really bold claims that revealed truth to people who were open-minded. For those who have ears to hear, they could ponder it and go deeper. But the parables would also conceal his message from those who were against him so that he could buy more time. Buy time for what? Well, Jesus was preparing his closest followers for the greatest surprise yet. Jesus claimed that Israel's God was coming to rule over his people, not through coercion or violent force, but through self-giving love as he was going to die for their sins. But his death wasn't the end. Right. He said that his death would be like a tiny seed buried in the ground, but then it would grow and produce a crop with many seeds. So these parables, they explain who Jesus was and what he was up to. And the gospel authors have preserved these parables so that now every generation of Jesus' followers can read and ponder them. And imagine how God's kingdom is still at work even today. Right. These ancient parables are still full of new surprises and challenges. They're like a storehouse packed with treasures, some that are new, some that are old, and it's all just waiting to be discovered.
Today we're going to be looking at the story of the tenants. And it's a very simple story. Many of uh, Jesus' parables are so simple, but it's a story that explains our hearts, it explains God's patience, but also explains why the world as it is today. Many people ask the question, why is the world as it is? Why do I feel the way that I do? Why do I keep doing the things that I keep on doing? Well, the story today, we have a number of people who explain who God is and who we are and what the world is like. We meet an owner of the vineyard and he's a picture of the Lord, the person who's given us this world. We meet these tenants that is to, supposed to picture the history of the church in the Old Testament. But really, it is the same history that we belong to. It shows our hearts. It shares the servants, these men and people who come, who share the heart of God to these people. And we meet a son, a loving son, who wants a people for himself that betray the Son of God. But this story has a sort of sinister edge to it. It has a, a betrayal of the trust of the owner. And as we look at this world, we see a people that have betrayed the, uh, the promises of God. They've betrayed the person that we're made for. There's nothing worse than being betrayed. Uh, uh, one of my favourite films is Braveheart. And I've never been more ashamed to be English as uh, you watch the film. Uh, apparently some of the Scottish rugby players watch it before they play England. And I understand the hatred they have. And there's a moment in the middle of the film where Robert the Bruce makes an allegiance with the English and doesn't fight for the Scottish. And William Wallace looks at him and sees him turn his back on the middle of a battle and he goes away when he needed him the most. There's a betrayal and a brokenness and there is a cry from William Wallace. Why, oh why, would you do that? You see, betrayal always hurts. The God of the Bible in the book of Hosea, chapter 11, says that we are like his children. I, I loved you. I, I called you to be my children. And he says, uh, I, the more I called my people, uh, uh, the more they went astray. He says, the story of this world is that you're made for me and you've just gone and gone and pushed me away and tried to live life without me. He said, you've sacrificed to different gods. You've lived for things of this world. Do you not understand I, I caused you to walk? I took you in my arms. Did you not realize I healed you and fed you? We hear the heart of God that he comes to a world that he calls his children. And we try and live without them. And as we look at this story this morning, it speaks of the betrayal of these tenants who have been given this vineyard to look after and Ultimately, they want it for themselves and they don't want the owner. They try to live away from the owner's hand and they ultimately want to be in charge. It's profound truths, isn't it? We don't want anyone telling us what to do. You hear that today, don't you? And they don't want God to be God. They want to be in charge. But then... We come to a world today, don't we, who are fumbling around for meaning, trying to find life without God, and there never is life. Just before the beginning of this parable, Jesus comes and people are praising Jesus. That It's the, the moment where he comes and it's Palm Sunday, a triumphal entry, and people are praising Jesus because they think he's going to come with a sword, he's going to be the warrior king, but... He turns out to be very different and within a few days they crucify him because they want a God that ultimately does what they want to do. Well, what can we learn from this parable this morning? Well, first and foremost, we, we must see the corruption of our, of our nature. If we look down at verse 14 and 15, 
There's that moment when the son comes and he is asking for these tenants to give what they uh, are due. And they think to themselves, they think the matter over, will they give to the tenant's son what is due? And they think, well, this is the heir. Let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. You see, they're willing to kill the son to get what they want. So many people will not listen to God. And ultimately, they don't want there to be a God. <laughs> and the, the sinister story of this world is that we, ha- again and again, have kept God at arm's length. And we can say it's innocent, but really, we just don't want there to be a God. These people were wanting some inheritance, and it's material gain, isn't it? They just want to live for a happy, easeful life. But also, Jesus speaks about these people who he's speaking to. They just want popularity, They want people to look at them and feel at home for a little while and people to look and think, what a lovely person they are. But when we reject God, it's never innocent. It's always taking something that is of his and making it our own. It's saying what God has given is really mine and I don't want him. It's a betrayal. And as Jesus looks at these people, he's saying, you have rejected the cornerstone of the building. He's saying that there's this huge building uh, uh, that ultimately has to uh, stand on this capstone or the cornerstone, the foundations. And if you reject that foundation, you, you won't understand who you are and why you're here. You'll have a lostness within your soul. You won't understand what life is really about until you come to this cornerstone, the foundation of this world, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that parable or or that story that Jesus gives in Matthew 7 of the person who builds his life on the sand. And we all laugh, don't we? Oh, I'll never build my life upon the sand. But when grief, or monetary issues come about, when we feel powerless, we realise what our foundations are built upon. Jesus says, you're meant for him. You're meant for a relationship with him. And the rejection of Jesus is an offence because you are made for him. When Jesus says these words, they they are offensive to the chief priests because they exactly know why he's speaking these words. He's telling them about their history. He's telling them about their people and he's telling them about their hearts. And do you know what? The gospel is offensive. It shows us for what we're we're like and it, it is always hurtful. But Jesus shows us our heart so that we don't carry on down that road. He shows us what we're capable of. And we've all had those moments, haven't we, where we've seen uh, what we're capable of. We've said a word or we've put a phone down on someone or we've been cut up and or we've done things in the darkness of night. And we think, why did I do that? And God sometimes touches our hearts and shows us really what we're like because Our hearts are deceitful above all things. And the human heart is an enemy to God, the Bible says. These teachers of the law knew that he was speaking about them, but they would not submit. They wouldn't say sorry. They wouldn't come to Jesus. They rejected the person who they're made for because they really wanted to live for those idols of popularity and material gain. You know, so often people make silly excuses for why they don't believe in God. Uh, A lot of people make uh, silly excuses of saying everything came from nothing, the evolution argument. They try and quiet their conscience to say that they're not that bad. Or they gather people around them with the same sort of mindset. Or they just try and keep busy, not trying to think about the big questions of what's going to happen when I die and why do I feel the way I do? Jesus' sacrifice on the cross will never mean anything to you until you realise what you're like. 
You'll never understand the depths of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never understand why he had to be separated, why he had to go through that agonizing death until you realize the corruption of your heart. You see, the Bible says you, you need your heart to be changed. You need uh, the Spirit of God to come in and rip out the old uh, fleshly heart and give you a, a heart that will live for God. Jesus says he is the great physician. He is the one who, he is the only one who can do that for you. Now, will you admit that to him? Will you admit how bad you are? You see, this story tells us of the long-suffering nature of the Lord. You see, look at verse 13 of, of Luke 20. He says, the vineyard owner says, what shall I do? He sent prophets, he sent people again and again, these servants. And they're not willing to listen. They hurt them and wound them. So he sends his son. And again and again, the Lord pleads with us. And is even willing to send his son. I want you to imagine the betrayal that the Lord must have felt. Just imagine you've had someone in your house. I've spoken to people who've, who've children who have stolen from them and the betrayal, the hurt. Do they not know how much I love them? And, and they've stolen because of a, a, a drug habit or because they're in debt. My great-grandfather uh, did an amazing thing uh, uh, for my grandfather. My grandfather wasn't a good man. He was really a man who lived for himself. He was a womanizer. He was a man who jumped from one relationship to the next and ultimately left uh, my grandma and uh, committed suicide because of the guilt and the shame that he felt. There was one instance that uh, my grandfather, a great grandfather, took my grandfather in. He was a bank clerk and allowed uh, him to join the, uh, the the bank that he was working for. He he owned the uh, the bank. Uh, my great grandfather. Anyway, my, my grandfather did what he did. He started uh, cutting corners. He didn't fill out the tax forms that he's supposed to do. And then uh, the IRS saw the, the the tax office come and they find out that the bank of been doing corrupt works because of my grandfather. My great-grandfather did an amazing thing. He decided to take the blame for what my grandfather did. He didn't want my grandfather to feel the shame and the guilt and take the punishment he deserved, so he went to jail for four years instead of my grandfather. You see, it was a great display of love for this young man. And as we look at the Bible, uh, in that same passage in Hosea, we see the character of God. He said, my people are determined to, to, to run away from me, to turn from me. But he says, how can I give you up? How can I hand you over? How can I treat you like my enemies? How can I make you like my enemies? He says, I want to treat you with compassion. And he, 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 he sends in this story of the tenants, people again and again to these tenants so that they would turn and give the Jews that, the, that should be given to the vineyard owner. The history of the world is, is full of people who've gone and declared the glory of God. Prophets, priests, preachers, pastors who've gone into the world and said, turn and find life in Jesus. He loves you so much. And as we look at this world, uh, the, the God of heaven and earth is, is not playing hide and seek. He, he, he shows a, a, a creation to show he is the creator God. And he works on people's consciences by his Holy Spirit. But more than that, he sends his son. He sends the Christ so that we can understand who God is and the heart of God. All the guessing games of God are gone when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to this world. And he sends his son because he's not willing that anyone would perish. He sends his son because he is long-suffering and patient. He sends his son because his son is his best. And he places a value on us. As he sends his son, he's saying how much he loves us and wants us 
for himself. Would you send your son to people who've stolen and taken and treated your world as we have? Would you send your best to the people who have murdered and wounded those people who just wanted good? The Bible says he treats us in grace. That word grace just means he treats us with undeserved kindness. He kisses this world in love by sending the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder today, do you understand that love that sent Jesus to this world, that sent Jesus to this cross to ransom, to heal, to forgive? Do you understand that he came for you and he came for your sin? That he is placing a value on you that he's worth more than the whole world. I know with my family and my children, I I love them more than anything, and I would die for them, but the Lord Jesus Christ comes and dies for his enemies. That passage I read earlier, the God of heaven and earth delights to show mercy. And he's patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish. When it says he delights in mercy, it says he longs, he loves to forgive his enemies. That's us. We're the tenants. Those people who have betrayed and hurt and killed, we are those people. And Jesus is good. Not only good, he is the best. He's the only one who can make us right. Well, finally, for those people who continue to reject it, there is a just judgment. Look at verse 16. The vineyard owner comes And you ask the question, what will the owner of the vineyard do in verse 15? He will come and deal with those tenants. He will kill them and give the vineyards to another. I think all of us listen to this story and we think, we want justice. You just imagine it. You've sent your son, you've sent your servants, and they've all been dealt with in a wrong way. And he's given his son, and all they want to do is take take, take again. And in a law court, you'd be thinking, do something about these people. How dare they deal with this man, this generous, lovely man? We cry out justice, don't we? We're we're very much call out for justice. And we think, Lord, why don't you deal with the injustices of this world? And the Bible says he will. There'll be a day when everything will be laid bare and King Jesus, instead of being a suffering servant, will be the judge of the human race. And he'll ask, what did you do with this gift that I gave you in coming to die for you? There was an emotional story I heard a few years ago of a, of a man whose job was to control a bridge that uh, trains would go over. There were boats that go under and they would have to lift the bridge. And there was, uh, I think it is a true story of uh, this man who was controlling the bridge and he was playing with his son and his son was playing by the water and his son started to drown. And they heard the dreaded noise of a train coming along the way and he had a decision to make. Would he do all the job and, uh, uh, and save the people on the train coming across? Or would he save his son? And he made the choice that he would sacrifice his son to save the people on the train. He pressed the button and he, he ran down the hill and he, he got into the water, but it was too late. And as he looked up, he saw the people on the train driving past, eating their croissants, reading their newspapers, And as he thought to himself that these people don't even know what I've done to save them, to sacrifice my son, they carry on eating their croissants on the newspaper, carrying on in their lives, and they haven't realised that I've given the greatest sacrifice. So many people carry on in their lives like that, but we all know, don't we? We all know, as we've looked at this story, that the intentions of these tenants was really they didn't want God. That they suppressed the truth of God and really they wanted to live for themselves. 
And that is the, the story of the human race. That, that we have rejected God and that we have all gone our own way. And the Bible says that he has sent the Lord Jesus Christ to take away the iniquity of the world. But if you won't, the, the, the judgment is right on us. That, that we deserve to take the punishment because we have taken what is of God's and we look around the world and we see wars and we see uh, uh, dreadful atrocities in the news and we think we are the issue, it's not God. We have turned our back on God and we see the issues of this world and we cry out justice, justice. But then we ask the question, if God did step round my house, would I be able to stand? Would I be able to say I, I've re received the gift that Jesus has given by taking the anger and punishment that I deserve. That was the thing that led me to the Lord. I, I remember that a man who just became a Christian when I was in uh, a far off country in New Zealand and he asked me the question, Tim, uh, if God did step round your house today, why would you be allowed into heaven? And uh, I thought, well, I've done some good things. I've helped people. And he says, but Jesus, you're rejecting Jesus, the one who died for you. Are you going to continue down that road? And I realized, however much I tried, I couldn't get myself right with God. That only Jesus was the one who can make me right. Now, in the book of Romans, it says, consider the kindness of God. Do not turn your back on this kindness otherwise otherwise you'll be cut off from the living God I think we so often flatter ourselves that God could never be angry at our sin but no he's a just God he's a holy God he's a perfect God and we're thankful that he will deal with all the injustices I think so often we flatter and lie to ourselves that we think that uh, God's patience will never run out, but there will be a day. No, they knew the parable will, was about themselves, these chief priests and teachers of the law, but they weren't willing to humble themselves. And ultimately, they get what they deserve. They ultimately will be dealt with in justice. But as we look at this story, and as we look at uh, the just judgment the great story of the Bible is that God has come and he stepped out of, the, of the, 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 the judgment seat and he is willing to take the punishment we deserve. All these chief priests and teachers of the law, all these people have rejected, all they needed to do is say, Lord, I am sorry, forgive me, I confess my sin. I accept that I have been running, running, running and I need you to forgive me. And the Bible says this one full of mercy and grace will come in grace and mercy. I wonder if you'd like to pray uh, with me to close the service today uh, so that you would understand this forgiveness and accept the forgiveness that Jesus has provided for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this amazing story that Jesus gave to show us our hearts. And I pray that every heart listening in today would find forgiveness in him. Bless every heart, we pray, for your glory. Amen. We're going to hear a story now of someone who accepted Jesus for themselves. Well, in the home where I grew up, uh, faith was not something that was talked about very much. Uh, my father was a professor of drama, my mother a playwright. Uh, when I went to college and those discussions in the dorm late at night about religion uh, began to occur, I had no particular reason to attach value uh, to a faith system. It had never been something I was familiar with or had internalized at all. And I assumed that any religious feelings that anyone held must be on the basis of some emotional experience, and I didn't trust those, or on the basis of some childhood indoctrination, uh, which I felt I was fortunate to have missed. I loved the experience of learning about the human body and all of the components of that, and I particularly loved being introduced to genetics. But then I ended up in the medical school curriculum sitting at the bedside of patients with diseases. This was no longer an abstract study of molecules and organ systems. These were real people. 
And one afternoon, one of my patients, a wonderful elderly woman, much like a grandmother, uh, who had very bad heart disease. Uh, she had a particularly bad episode of chest pain uh, while I was with her. She got through it, and at the end of that, explained to me how her faith was the thing that helped her in that situation. She realized that the doctors around her weren't really giving her that much help, but her faith was. And after she finished her own very personal description uh, of that faith, she turned to me, and I had been silent, and she looked at me quizzically, and she said, what do you believe, doctor? And ultimately, I had to admit to myself that her question had made me realize that I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. If there's one thing scientists claim they do is to arrive at conclusions based upon evidence. And I hadn't taken the trouble to do that. I was greatly assisted uh, by a pastor who lived down the road who I went and asked about all this and who gave me a copy of C.S. Lewis's wonderful book, Mere Christianity, because here was an Oxford scholar, a prodigiously developed intellect, who had traveled the same path. Within those pages, I realized for the first time that one can come to belief on a rational basis and that, in fact, given the many pointers that one sees around oneself in terms of the universe and it having a beginning and its fine-tuning in terms of the way in which all those constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy seem to have been set just in a certain very precise range to make life possible uh, and many other things including my beloved mathematics and why they actually work anyway to describe the universe something that makes you think the creator must have been a mathematician that brought me then to the person of Jesus Christ as a person who was historically extremely well documented. That was news to me. I thought Christ was as much myth as history and I realized after reading more about it, this was a historical figure upon which we have a great deal of evidence for his existence and his teachings and even his rising from the dead in a literal way. That day at uh, my patient's bedside started a journey for me. A journey that I was reluctant uh, to begin, but I felt I needed to. A journey that I thought would result in strengthening my atheism, but to my surprise, resulted in my conversion. Oh, my.
Well, as a church, we will be having a, a number of different courses running. In January, we're going to be running a course called Christianity Explored, if you want to find out more. But please do get in contact with the church. We'll be do, doing a number of candlelit services over the break. We have one on the 13th and the 20th. Please follow the links and email the church if you want to book your place. But if you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ today, please get in contact with us and we'd love to help you in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you and we look forward to hearing from you. Trusting in your word, trusting in your word.